6.30 p.m. Good evening, I'm Chu Lin on News 5 Tonight. SMRT says it will spend nearly a billion dollars to improve its train systems after a slew of recent disruptions. When you want to grow the economy, Kate, we less Singaporean, you must accept foreign interests. A government report lays out scenarios to press home the need to continue attracting immigrants. Cheap petrol for all, not anymore. The Indonesian government moves to impose limits after failing to pull off price hikes. And how Singapore plans to fight a rising trend of new and young drug abusers. Train operator SMRT has announced major plans costing some $900 million over the next eight years to renew and upgrade its rail system. The cost will be shared with the Land Transport Authority. And this follows recent service disruptions four times this month alone. As MRT said that as the MRT system ages, faults will arise from time to time. Latest statistics have shown that the number of train withdrawals due to faults have been increasing since January 2009. So the $900 million plan will help to mitigate future disruptions due to aging assets. The plan includes the ongoing $195 million previously announced measure to replace the signalling system for the north, south and east-west lines. The amount also covers the purchase of new electronic signaling carts that will help tackle the current signaling problems and replacing all sleepers, the component that helps to secure tracks on the north, south and east, west lines. We have a plan which now is based not only on uh, the need to maintain, but also uh, the need to recognise that the, some parts of the systems, there is issue with aging. There's also issue that uh, uh, with uh, increased usage. Even as the public inquiry into last December's train disruptions on the North South Line is underway, more measures were also announced to prevent a recurrence. The disruptions were traced to the slouch clause on the third rail, which supplies electricity to power the trains. SMRT will now replace all claws with this fifth generation claw that comes with a positive locking system to better secure the third rail. Each MRT line will also be fitted with a vibration monitoring system. SMRT says in order to facilitate the major projects, there will be the need to have planned closures or changes to service hours. Now, these will be worked out with the Land Transport Authority, but it says it will plan it well and will try as much to time the disruptions to coincide with off-peak days or hours. SMRT says it will work on its response time in the event of a disruption. Mr Tan said the first 30 minutes is the most crucial, so SMRT will work on disseminating information quickly and ensure that ground support is activated promptly. Meanwhile, the first commuter has taken the stand in the public hearing into last year's disruptions. Charlene Ang told the Committee of Inquiry that she fainted when her train stalled on the 15th of December. She said there was a burning smell and some lights as well as the air conditioner were not working. There was also an update on the availability of information leaflets to commuters affected by a breakdown. This had found to be inconsistent across stations. Today, the committee heard that at least one station, Ang Mo Kyo Station, is now well prepared for this. Every station is supposed to have 1,000 bus service leaflets and 200 taxi vouchers to give out. The vouchers are for students heading to school for exams. A government report says Singapore needs to continue attracting immigrants to slow the decline and aging of its citizen population. It says if the country's total fertility rate stays the same, we'll need 20 to 25,000 new citizens each year. The Utram Chinatown District, located in central Singapore, has one of the highest concentration of elderly residents. This is what Singapore could look like by 2030 when the number of elderly citizens will triple to 900,000, representing about 30% of the population. Compounding this, the country's low total fertility rate of 1.2. In its latest report, the National Population and Talent Division set out five scenarios. One, if the TFR goes up to the replacement rate of 2.1. Two, if the TFR is at the current 1.2 with no immigration. 
and the rest with the current fertility rate, but with an inflow of 15,000, 20,000 or 25,000 new citizens each year. Without immigration, the paper shows that citizen deaths will exceed births in 13 years. By 2025, the population will also start to age and shrink, with the median age being 45, up from the current 39 years. The citizen workforce will also start to shrink. Currently, there are 6.3 working-age citizens supporting each elderly citizen. By 2030, this ratio will drop to 2.1, is to one. With more exiting the workforce, economists say the burden of taxes will fall on the smaller pool of working adult citizens. So there is a trade-off here that all Singapore citizens they must accept. That if they want to be helped to be subsidized when they're old, as less Singaporeans are now paying tax in support of the aging population. And if they want to be subsidized because they have low wages, then you must grow the economic cake. And when you want to grow the economic cake with less Singaporean, you must accept foreign workers. As one united people. The paper points out that immigration will help slow down the decline in the pool of working age citizens and the rate of aging among the population. Taking in 20 to 25,000 new citizens each year will also bump up the citizen all-age support ratio slightly from 2.1 to 2.4 working citizens for every elderly citizen in 2013. Singapore has been granting between 18 and 20,000 citizenships to foreigners over the past three to four years. Analysts say while new citizens need to be integrated, the bigger issue is with permanent residents, which they say may have more issues with assimilation. The data doesn't provide any information regarding the influx or the projected uh, intake of permanent residents. The PRs actually occupy, take up quite a significant uh, component of the population, the new migrants, so to speak. So I think uh, it, will be more help it will be helpful if we have more information about uh, what kind of projection we are looking at. The paper is expected to form the basis of discussions with focus groups and the public for a white paper to be released by the National Population and Talent Division at the end of the year. Now this paper will set out issues important to Singapore and strategies for a sustainable population. Now, this will cover areas such as housing, transport and land use. Now the public consultation is expected to take place in the middle of the year. Well, the People's Association will launch an integration council this weekend to better structure and coordinate integration efforts. It will also set up nearly 90 integration committees on the ground. The Indonesian cabinet is meeting to decide how to set limits on the use of subsidized fuel after failing to get parliament's approval to raise fuel prices last month. Curbs are expected to be set from next month, probably on larger private vehicles and government vehicles. The era of cheap petrol for car owners in Indonesia may soon come to an end. Well, at least for some. Industry experts believe the government will only allow cars with engine capacity of 1,500cc or smaller to use subsidized fuel. That currently costs around 50 US cents a litre, one of the cheapest in the world. The World Bank maintains the current subsidy program is ill-targeted and benefits car owners who are generally better off. Putting fuel prices where they are is basically like giving a check for 1 million rupiah per month to anyone who owns a car and drives about 200 liters per month. The Indonesian government subsidizes half the price of the lowest grade petrol to the tune of about 14 billion US dollars annually. And with world fuel prices rising, that amount has ballooned by close to 1.4 billion US dollars so far this year. The government will not need parliament's approval should it want to curb the use of subsidized fuel. Nor will it likely face street protests similar to the ones last month. But with cheap subsidized fuel still available, it will have to continue dealing with black market practices that may inevitably benefit from any new ruling. Sujadi Siswa, Channel News Asia, Jakarta. Malaysian electoral reform group Bursay 3.0 is going ahead with its planned rally in the heart of Kuala Lumpur this Saturday. Organizers expect 100,000 people to turn up at Madeka Square.
Now, says Bursay co-chair Ambiga Srinivasan. The coalition of 84 NGOs is prepared to push ahead with the peaceful sit-in this Saturday at this historic Medeka Square at 2 p.m. local time, despite failing to obtain green light from the city mayor and the corporation of the city police. If there's any sincerity in meeting what we're asking for, that guarantee would come by now. Now, the former Bar Council president added that the slew of law reforms pushed through by Prime Minister Najib in Parliament in the past weeks would have meant nothing without free and fair elections. They also refused to shift venue last minute, adding that the Medeka Square is the perfect place for the rally. In English mean Freedom Square, in Arabic mean Tahrir Square. We believe, actually, that if at all there are to be changes in government, etc., it will be done through the ballot box. That's how we want to do it, and that's why we want clean and fair elections. Now, the Bursay 2.0 rally last year saw over a thousand protesters arrested and scores were injured during crackdown by riot police. Now, this time round, the organizers said they are well prepared for Bursay 3.0. Over 6,000 security personnel, including 100 doctors, are on duty this Saturday. Now, Bursay 3.0 rallies will be held simultaneously in 11 cities nationwide, while similar protests will be held across 72 cities around the world. Melissa Go, Channel News Asia, at the Madeka Square, Kuala Lumpur. Tension between the Philippines and China in the South China Sea could go up another notch after findings released by a Philippine exploration firm. Philex says a natural gas discovery in the sea's Reed Bank contains more reserves than initially thought. This comes as Philippine and Chinese ships remain locked in a three-week standoff in another part of the sea. Beijing has also slammed a call by Manila yesterday for other countries to take a stand. The Philippines said its neighbors should fear China's growing aggression over territorial claims. After the break, a cab catches fire in a CTE tunnel causing chaos. Plus... Money, obviously. And pay aside, we find out what drives workers here who are found to be highly motivated compared to others in Asia. I like the order. Welcome back. You're looking at a taxi that caught fire in a Central Expressway tunnel this morning. The video was sent to us by Mr. William Cock. It happened at about 10 a.m. just before the CTE exit to Ken Hill. No one was hurt and firefighters put out the blaze in minutes, but it did cause a massive traffic jam which took some time to clear. A 78-year-old retiree has been fined $3,000 for setting his neighbor's cat on fire. Chua Tuang Singh thought the animal was responsible for cat poo that he'd recently found outside his Pasiris flat. So he squirted kerosene on the cat and threw a burning piece of newspaper at it. The cat was b badly burned on its face, neck and back. The judge said the act was not right and ordered Chua to pay the cat's owner more than $1,200 for medical costs. Chua, who has throat and colon cancer pleaded for leniency. Well, Singapore is going to use hair analysis to detect drug abuse. It's effective up to three months after drugs are used, whereas urine testing has a window of about one week. This was among measures recommended to tackle a rising trend of drug abuse among the young. The number of young abusers below 20 years old arrested last year was 257, an increase of 178 compared to 2007. To target this group, the current direct supervision order regime will be enhanced to reduce their risk of relapse. Besides the current urine testing, it will now include casework and counselling. For young abusers of moderate risk, the task force has recommended the setting up of a community rehabilitation centre, a step-down arrangement following their detention in the drug rehabilitation centres. It will allow them to continue with their education or employment during the day and undergo counselling in the evenings. The task force also hopes to address the attitude of young abusers. They think that uh, eyes, for example, will not be uh, addictive uh, or will not be damaging to their bodies if they take in a particular way or they take in a particular dosage. Uh, these are all wrong. 
Secondly, they also think that they will not be, they will not be detectable and therefore they will not be arrested. They also use it as for recreational purposes. One key recommendation is to reach out to families and establish community-based treatment and support. What we intend to do is basically to look at how we can uh, ref uh, look at revising the programs or the halfway houses. We look at enhancing the uh, counselling, uh, substance abuse counselling programs, uh, support groups, enhance the support groups, support for them. And also looking at how to improve the competency-based training for the uh, social workers as well as the volunteers. The Home Affairs Ministry will also work with voluntary welfare organisations to increase the number of halfway house places to strengthen the support system for ex-drug abusers. A survey of employees in Asia has shown that those in Singapore are highly motivated in their work and frequent communication and encouragement from managers plays a big part. What keeps employees motivated? Money, obviously. But assuming the employee is paid to his satisfaction, the survey went beyond monetary motivation to find that behaviours exhibited by managers play a crucial role in motivating employees. Nearly 60% of respondents working in Singapore said they are quite or very motivated, compared with the regional average of 55%. Key findings were that they had managers who allowed them high flexibility in doing their jobs. But employees noted that their leaders should be more encouraging with their words. You should, you ought or you have to. Avoid those phrases, you're more likely to motivate your employees. When you put, put forward a point and it's not being taken in and considered, you get quite upset. So it, it sort of put you off. They need to understand what's the lower rank need to do because they can't order people, they must do together. And motivating employees the correct way leads to an improved work performance. Based on the survey findings, some key recommendations were made for managers to raise an employee's motivation in Singapore. They include listening to them more attentively, asking their opinion more frequently and involving them in the decision-making process whenever possible. Respondents in small and medium enterprises were also more likely to say their managers listened attentively to them compared with those from larger companies. And still to come on five, a look ahead to the Champions League where Chelsea are prom promising to go on the offensive at Barcelona. And technology that you can control with your eyes may become the latest must-have for the masses. In business news, more financially trained individuals are coming out to serve in the audit committees of Singapore-listed companies. That's according to a survey by the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Singapore. It says better qualified audit committee members can help companies navigate the complex web of regulatory requirements. The total value of electricity bought and sold in Singapore hit a record $9.7 billion last year, up 21% from 2010. The energy market company says this was largely due to the rising cost of fuel. Businesses accounted for 60% of demand. And here are the market numbers. A massive football match in the Champions League holders Barcelona host Chelsea in a few hours, carrying a 1-0 deficit from the first leg of their semi-final tie. The English side now face the daunting task of holding out for a result. We are in the end camp now uh, and uh, we have 90 minutes uh, game to, to reach the finals. 90 minutes for the home side to batter the Blues defence for the precious goals to make their second consecutive final. It may be Barcelona's fifth straight semi-final, but they appear more vulnerable in this match than ever before. After being shocked in the first leg by the Blues, the Catalan side was beaten by arch-rivals Real Madrid in El Clasico over the weekend. Many say Pep Guardiola's side looks tired after the gruelling 2-1 loss to Real. It's not tired in the legs, maybe in the mind, but we're going to try to not don't have tired in, in our heads. So, in this situation, in semi-final Champions League, no matter. Uh, if we play three days ago or we play yesterday, we'll be ready to compete, to try to, to rise to the final, to rise to Munich. 
To do that, Barca need to score and make sure Chelsea don't. In the first leg though, Chelsea had put up a blue wall allowing Barca possession, but not goal. Instead, it was the Blues who nicked the goal through Didier Drogba with practically their only shot of the match. It's a result Chelsea would gladly take again. You do need a, a little bit uh, of luck on your side to be able to, uh, to win a competition like this. But certainly uh, the squad that we have at Chelsea and the, the players that we have, I think, uh, is very good. Most of Chelsea's first team were rested over the weekend in the league match against Arsenal. It's rest they'll need to face the Heat at the Camp Nou tonight to make only their second Champions League final in the club's history. Well, it wasn't too long ago that touch screens became all the rage in the world of technology. And now a Swedish company hopes to up the ante with an iTech solution. It's all in the eyes. This man can operate his computer simply by directing his gaze and blinking, which works like moving and clicking a mouse. And it's all thanks to eye tracking technology. Cameras record the computer user's eye movements and send commands to the software, which in turn executes the commands. Thing. You're using your eye muscle to select something instead of just to look at something. So, uh, so maybe in the beginning, you, you know, it might be a little tired in the eyes or something like that, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not that difficult. Such technology is well established in the care sector, where it's been used by people with special needs and disabilities. But the Swedish company that's been developing the technology wants to take it to the masses. They recently unveiled a gaze eye controller for Microsoft's new Windows 8. Plug a webcam-like device into your computer and you can swipe and double-click just by moving your eyes. They've also harnessed the eye-tracking technology in arcade games. And there are plans to integrate the system into cars to detect whether the driver is paying attention to the road. We are just going to put the on what we want to do. This will be in every car and every computer. It's more likely to be used as a directional tool with other control methods. For instance, look at the icon you want to open and click on a touchpad to work it. So keep an eye out over the next few years. Before you know it, your computer mouse or game controller might have disappeared in the blink of an eye. And that's News 5 tonight. Good night.